everybody, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tom. I have another three-peat guest on today, which I'm very excited about. When you have that kind of history with somebody, it's way more fun. Stephen Kotler, welcome to the show. Tom, it's great to see you again. Dude, for real. Um, first of all, somehow I missed, or maybe this happened since last we spoke, but I can't imagine. You've been twice nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, that none of that happened. Yeah, that's happened along the way. Small Furry Prayer and Stealing Fire were both uh, nominated by the publishers for uh, for the Pulitzer. That's crazy. Congratulations, amazing. Thank you. Um, the new book, which I am super stoked on, and honestly, um, never have I read a book that so lined up with my personal experience where I thought, oh my God, yes, like somebody's putting words and science to this thing that feels so perfectly aligned with what I have experienced. Um, the book being The Art of Impossible. In it, you talk about something that really lit me on fire, which is this notion of um, the habit of inferiority. And I want to start there, and then we'll get into sort of what you mean by impossible and all that stuff. Um, totally. totally. But you the habit, the yeah. habit yeah. of inferiority. All right, so I wish I, 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 wish I would have known it was coming because the habit of inferiority is, is a quote from – Harvard psychologist William James and it was it's either in the very first psychological textbook ever written 1901 or uh, something he wrote right around then so this is turn of the century and what he was talking about at the time was the fact that most people have second wins right we have a first win you get tired you push through you got a second win. he said but most of us have no idea we've got a third wind and a fourth wind and a fifth wind because we never get used to even pushing into that second wind, let alone beyond. And he said the reason is that human beings, one way or another, are designed to work at much greater speed and with much greater efficiency, but we've gotten the habit of inferiority, right? We are, we've gotten used to performing at a mediocre level, and that's what we expect. And for geeky reasons that we can cover in a second if you want to. There's a lot of neurobiology that basically says your body is a homostatic system. And when you level set it at mediocre, it is gonna take extraordinary amounts of motivation and energy to get up to like super expert, right? You have to train, you have to fight how you train and train how you fight to quote the army. And that was the point James was making, but he's also making, hey, we're all hardwired for extraordinary if we can get out of the habit of inferiority. So that's another thing in the book that um, it comes towards the very, very end. I think it was the quote of the final chapter, and it resonated with me in the same way that this early concept of how we all habituate ourselves to inferiority was the Nietzsche quote of, today is greatness possible. Um, what does that quote mean to you? Because when I it hit me and I was like, oh my God. And then I thought, actually, I'm not sure if he means it the way that I'm taking it, which is like, asking yourself that every day to like be charged up and get after it. But so yes and no. So little context around Nietzsche that's in the book. Nietzsche was the, is considered the first modern high performance philosopher or thinker. And the reason when I say modern, what I mean is he did his work right after Darwin wrote the origin of species. So suddenly, Oh wow. Body evolves over time, shaped by evolution and blah, blah, blah. And if you want to understand how to kind of improve the body or understand the body, you need to understand evolution. Nietzsche said, and it was one of a whole bunch of thinkers who were like, hey, wait a minute, mind evolves, consciousness evolves. For those of us interested in getting more out of our life, he wanted us interested in becoming the Ubermensch, right? The Superman. He thought it was in all, within all of us. I tend to agree. James tended to agree. The big difference, Nietzsche said, hey, only 10% of the population should try this. James Why? said, no, no. Um, very good point, maybe true today, doubtful. His point was, and this was from Nietzsche through about the humanist psychologist. So like Jung sort of thought this way, and then you get into like Carl Rogers and Maslow, and that's sort of the line. So in the 30s and 40s, it starts to shift. But the general thinking was, to be really blunt, mommy and culture way too much. And most of us, this was, remember, 18th century Victorian era, Right. And Freud especially was like the way to mommy, the way to family, the way to all that psychosis you're inheriting and the way to these really repressive cultures. If you don't like ever all of them said you have to break with this stuff completely. 
Um, I think that's probably still true today to some level. You have to become your own person, and autonomy really matters for peak performance, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think culture is nearly as restrictive, but all that also depends where you were born, what you look like, what kind of money you have, et cetera, et cetera. So wait, he was saying that you're so weighed down by this stuff that you won't be able to break out of it, so don't even bother. And by the way, no, no, so no. I've- No, he was saying that most people are not gonna be able to pull it off. Um, he had a formula. Like as I laid out, Nietzsche had a four-step process that has not really changed. He was trying to follow the biology. To becoming you, the Superman. Yeah, to becoming the Superman. And as you said, when you read the book, you went, oh my God, it's all this stuff. The reason it's all this stuff is we are all biologically shaped by evolution. We are all designed for peak performance. There's a limited set of tools. There, There's a lot of them, obviously, but they're limited. They're meant to work in an order, in a sequence, and that, like Nietzsche, anybody who's ever done this, when they read The Art of Impossible at any level, right? You should read and go, oh wow, this is a bunch of stuff that's familiar to me because I'm doing it. I didn't know all this other stuff was around it. To people who haven't really gone after super high hard goals, it may be completely new to them. And wow, there's a blueprint, who knew? But for folks who have gone hard, they should have your experience of, oh my God, I didn't like, here's all the science, here's, here's everything in order, I did all this shit. Of course you did. There's, we all have the same biology to work with. So Nietzsche so, noticed it first. That That's what I want to talk about. So I've never read Nietzsche, and forgive me, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but it always feels weird to when you hear somebody say it to then just immediately adopt the, their way of saying it. Um, so what is, how did he define a Superman? Like I think of Superman, the guy in tights with the cape flying, literally yeah. who's okay, right so, over my shoulder. No, so all these people were interested in what, Abraham Maslow started terming self-actualization. They were interested in becoming the very best version of yourself that was possible, right? And for Nietzsche, all that was, much of that was about like creative self-expression also. So when he talks about being the best version of yourself, he's sort of like, you're excellent in a kind of innovative genius kind of way. And the, the quote I love from Nietzsche is, Man is something to be overcome. What have you done today to overcome him? What did he mean by that? He like your that, weaker, meant, inferior no. nature? Well, as I, so the point we've been making all along is the only thing peak performance can be is figuring out how to get your biology to work for you rather than against you. But when you're not working with your biology, it will actually work against you, right? And it really will, like, you know, sort of crush you one way or another. And I'll give you a simple example. We can go into a lot of detail, but there are eight major known causes of depression. Two of them are the very familiar ones. One of them is genetics, right? I don't have, I can't manufacture serotonin or dopamine, take your pick. And the other is trauma, obviously. The other six are li literally about what happens when you screw up your intrinsic motivation. What hap, right? When you're not, when you're not living with passion, purpose, regular access to flow, all of the things that essentially the art of most possible is, are about the tools that I'm we're breaking down. When you use them right, the result is Superman. When you use them wrong or don't use them at all, if you're not using the organism the way the organism is designed to be used, the result is anxiety and depression. And we're in the middle of the largest anxiety and depression kind of epidemic in the history of the world. So there's, I, it strikes me that there's a correlation here. That's interesting. So um, I want to push on this idea of of man is to be overcome and what have you done today to overcome him so if man is sort of the baseline biology and i have to understand that i'm having this biological experience and i've got to work with my biology instead of against it let me give you a simple example let's get out of the theoretical simple example yep so one of the things peak so let's back up and what when we're talking about tools for peak performance simplest most powerful tool we have is our attention is focus Focus actually takes quite a bit of energy. What, like if you think about, I gotta pay attention to something I'm not totally interested in, you're burning a lot of calories. The brain is 2% of your body mass, 25% of your energy at rest. So when you're expending energy, right, big energy hog, the brain always wants to conserve energy. This is why when I said earlier we're homeostatic creatures and we get stuck in mediocrity, it's this problem. The brain wants to conserve energy. It doesn't wanna burn extra energy if it doesn't have to because it's trying to keep you alive makes sense um 
there are a lot of our intrinsic motivators give us focus for free. When you're curious about something, you get focus for free. When you're passionate about something, think about romantic love, when you fall in love with somebody, how much attention you pay to that person, that like that neurochemically is the same neurochemicals underneath any passion, right? Passion of entrepreneurship, the passion of doing a podcast, passion for writing a book, all of it's the same cocktail. Fear is a great one. Fear is a fantastic focusing mechanism. Peak performers, and you I know do this, I do this. When you're looking for a new challenge, you're like, well, what the hell scares me a lot? Because I know I'm gonna pay a lot of attention to it, and you go in that direction. You can't do that until you've laid in some other peak performance skills, but once you get good enough to use fear as a compass, basically, you get a tremendous amount of work done that everybody else has to spend energy on for free, simply because you've learned to like process, you know, handle the fear and, and you can trust your ability to step up to the challenge, et cetera, et cetera, all those kinds of things, you're getting tons of work done for free. So when it works, what are you getting for fear? Focus for free. When it doesn't work, what are you getting? Anxiety and depression, one of the largest ep epidemics on earth. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So going to the core concept of the book, which definitely feels like a companion piece to some of the earlier things you've written, especially the rise of Superman, you know, coming to understand just how far human potential is out there. Um, and the early thing that you talked about, you know, that fourth and fifth wind, um, that's the thing that, that David Goggins said that always resonated with me. When you just think you're broken, you're spent, you're, your second wind is dead and gone, you couldn't possibly go anymore, you're only 40% of the way to your actual abilities. And I, that just always hit me so hard. Reading the book, one, I love that you go into the process and make it seem like, hey, you can get better at all of these different steps. But there was one thing in the beginning that I found really interesting, and that is that you called it the art of impossible and not the science of impossible, even though you go ham on the science in the book. I'm guessing, or maybe not, but I'm guessing that you at one point considered that sort of alternate take on the title. Why would you ultimately focus the reader on the art of this all? It's a great question. And despite the fact that every single thing I did in, you know, I'm crazy about evidence-based performance, right? Like, you know, at the Flow Research Collective, we're training about a thousand people a month at this point, wow. you know, uh, between it's, I've trained, I think at this point, over a hundred thousand people. So there's a tremendous amount besides the neuroscience of how to research, get into flow or just peak yeah, performance how to in get general. Into, well, you can't flow comes with peak performance, right? So like all that stuff together, that's a lot of data points is my point. And so almost everything in the book is based on that, but a couple of things that are true, no matter what one, for example, flow triggers. You want more flow, there are flow triggers of 22 to work with. Which triggers you're gonna master and gonna be most useful for you, that comes down to your genetics and your early childhood experience. Those things play a major role. So I, I can say, these are the, this is the suite, this is the toolkit, figuring out which one lurks exactly perfectly for you, and they may change over time. That's an art. That's a self-awareness that you're gonna have to carry into the world. That's not something I can say, Tom, is exactly what you do, it's based on the evidence. And so like I, my staff, like I'm trained as a hardcore investigative journalist from a time when we had crazy, crazy fact checkers. So like I have five sources for every you know, fact I, I try to put in the book. Everything's been checked with five other, you know what I mean? And I'm just nuts about it. And the scientific method, I work with some of the smartest neuroscientists in the world and they won't work with me if I'm not super crazy rigorous and I start spouting nonsense in public, right? My company goes away. So like everything is super, I try to tighten it down as possible, but I can't tell you that everything in the book is completely evidence-based. 90% of it is evidence-based, but there's a section, for example, on long haul creativity. What does it take to sustain creativity at a really high level over a long career? There's very little research done on that in the real world. I have spent 10 years investigating experts about it, and I summed it up and gave you the best stuff I thought in the book. That's still my opinion. And so I couldn't call it the science of impossible because even though it's probably 85% there, there's 15% that it's not, and I don't think it's truthful. And the other side of it is there's an art to it. You have to bring your own 
I can't train you in self-awareness, right? I can train you in self-awareness a little bit, but you actually have to bring that in, into the work um, yourself. And that self-awareness is an art form. You know, the create learning how to be create creative, for example, is another one. Like I could tell you that one of the easiest ways to be creative, and you know this, is to develop a personal style. I'm not saying go high fashion or low. I'm saying style is a choice. Make a choice, right? If you're choosing to work at Microsoft and wear khakis and a button down because you blend in and it makes you a better manager, that's a choice. That's cool. You're being a ninja. I like it, right? But like when you're not making those choices on a moment by moment basis, you're not trading up creativity. I can tell you that as a fact. The next step in how to do that in your life, I'm now getting into my opinions and I try, like I try to differentiate and I couldn't, yeah. So that's me being a geek and like just an old, a reporter and like a guy trying to like work in neuroscience um, and be credible and respectable and things like that. But that's really why. There was something else in the book that um, I thought might be part of the answer. It certainly rhymes with what you were just saying, which is this concept of personality doesn't scale, biology scales. What did you mean by that? What the long story or the short? Um, I'll take the long one. What whatever is is most so useful. Here, here, here's the here. This is because this is a lesson I learned the super hard way, and I'll, so I'll, I'll go. I'll go in the middle, but I did not have a normal life by any stretch of the imagination. I was a working magician by the time I was 10 years old. I was doing bar mitzvahs and weddings. I was working in restaurants at 11 years old, doing birthday parties all Saturday and all Sunday. And magicians are strange, weird people that are like one step out of the circus and they're con men and jewel thieves and, right? And I went from being a magician to being a punk rocker and hanging out with bikers and more weird, dangerous kind of people. And then I went into covering action sports especially in the early days where like the people i knew once a month nearly died this was just how people lived their lives and i covered science mostly is that in that era field biologists i was an animal geek the field biologist you want to go to africa and hang out with lemurs you got to hang out with field biologists and you think the actions pro professional action sport athletes are, are dangerous and crazy and like i remember the, being in madagascar i got caught in a lightning storm once and while running through the mountains back to this jungle camp. And I got back there and Patricia Wright, the MacArthur Genius Award winning primatologist conversa conservation, who's a dear friend of mine was there. And she's like, did you get struck by lightning? I was like, what do you mean did I get struck? She's like, yeah, it happens. There was this guy from Harvard. He got struck twice on the way back once. Oh. And, I, and I was like, the people literally like, I'm hanging out with people who routinely, like they get struck by lightning twice <laughs> and still make it back to camp. Right. And this is just like another day. So my point is my risk tolerances were totally out of whack. I had like grown up in incredibly high risk, crazy environments. And I started learning something about peak performance and flow. And look, when anybody learns a little bit about peak performance, about flow, all that stuff, you make the same mistake. You start giving advice, especially those people you care about and love. And you, you're like, oh my God, I see so much potential in, in you. If you only just, right? And because I had, was publishing books and I was writing columns for Psychology Today and like I had some street cred, they took my advice. And one person nearly died, two people, one guy put himself in the hospital, one woman almost put herself in the hospital, almost caused a divorce, two friends still won't talk to me and I don't blame them. Um, the point is that personality doesn't scale things that are foundational to peak performance, what your risk tolerances are. These are genetically hardwired by dopamine receptors and availability of the neurochemical dopamine, and they're shaped by early childhood experience. You can change them over long periods of time, like a decade. You cannot flip a switch and do it overnight, no matter how hard you try, and it's really dangerous to do it. And it's not just that, where you are in the introversion, extroversion scale, same thing. So there's about 10 critical things to peak performance that are biologically or biologically hardwired and set up by early childhood experience that should create your personality that have huge impacts on how you should study and learn peak performance. There's another reason why it's an art and not a science, and this is the same answer. The point is personality doesn't scale. So many people in the coaching peak performance world, they figure out what works for them, they teach to other people, and they get disastrous results. People can't do it, it's not actionable, or they try to get it and they get bad results. 
it's for this very reason. We have a foundational idea at the, at the Flow Research Collective and in this book, Flow Research Collective is my, my company that studies this stuff, um, biology scales, because it, it's the very thing that evolution designed to work for everyone. So you find the foundation, and when I say biology, I really mean the neurobiology, neurobio what's going on in your brain and your body when you're performing at your very best. Figure out what that core basic mechanism is and, you, and train from that. If you try to train from personality or from psychology, people forget that when you use a term, for example, like mindset, if I say mindset, you probably think, I mean attitude towards life. When scientists say mindset, they mean a very specific thing that happens in the brain, and it does not mean attitude towards life. There's a whole other thing that we could talk about that is attitude towards life. They mean a very specific set of things that are going on in the brain that we may or may not completely understand yet, but psychology is a metaphor for neurobiology. Neurobiology is mechanism. It's not, it's not mechanism we understand 100%. But it's damn, we understand it well enough to be practical. So that's what I mean by that. And if you can get down to the mechanism, we are all designed for peak performance. We're hardwired for it we, by evolution. So that's the biology. That's what I mean by getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. And by the way, again, not a new idea to go back to William James. 1901, this is in the first psychological textbook ever written. He says, the great thing then in all education is to make your nervous system your ally and not your enemy. And so nervous how do you system do is that? brain. Well, let's, uh, you, why don't we start where the book starts, right? And the, because this is, uh, you know, my whole thing is like, hey, let's follow the biology. The biology starts someplace. As I said, all like, Focus and attention is the gateway to all performance, right? You have two big levers. You've got focus and attention, and then you've got habit, right? And the things you focus your attention on repeatedly and the actions you start executing as a result, those become your habits. Those are your big levers, right? So if I said earlier, the goal is to get focus for free, you have to start with your big intrinsic or internal motivators. I always say that you have to start with motivation because motivation is what gets you into the game. Um, and you, when you're interested in that, you really, now there's a certain amount of safety and security stuff that um, sort of, you have to be able to pay your bills and have a little left over, right, before this stuff starts working. If you're below that line, you have to solve that problem first. This isn't 100% of the time, but as a general rule, um, Meaning like Maslow's pyramid is not a real thing. It's not really a pyramid, but he wasn't particularly wrong about that for biological reasons. If you're not, if you have too much anxiety and fear, I can't make a living. I can't pay my bills. How am I going to eat? This stuff is really hard. So I'm not, I'm, I'm assuming that stuff is taken care of. If that stuff is taken care of, right? And you just a little bit over, uh, like my, my bills are being paid is you're fine. You can start there. The place you want to start is curiosity because it's the simplest motivational fuel. Curiosity neurochemically is a little bit of the neurochemical norepinephrine. This is, you know, if you get a lot of it, it's anxiety. Whoa, I'm paying too much attention to this shit. A little of it is excitement. A little bit primes your brain for learning. You're interested, you're like, what's gonna happen next kind of thing. And you get dopamine. Dopamine is talked about as a reward chemical, a pleasure chemical, cell phone dings, you know, you gotta, that's dopamine, that pleasure. but. It's basically a, it's a focusing chemical, but it also gets us up for the fight. It's a get, it gets you ready to take risks or, you know, encounter the world or step up. That's what dopamine's all about. Now, is curiosity, curiosity inborn or can you do things you to totally, generate yeah, it? You, you can totally cultivate curiosity over time. And the way you literally, I mean, it's not that hard. You literally have to notice anything that catches your attention and give it a couple extra, explore it for one extra beat, just follow, start following your curiosity. And the way, the next step is you have to turn curiosity into passion. And the point is really simple. Curiosity is a great motivator, right? When you're inter interested and curious about something, just think about any TV show you're kind of, oh my God, I didn't know they did ice fishing on Mars. Look at that, honey, right? Like you're paying a little bit of attention um, and you're not working at it. Passion is the next step. Passion is literally the intersection of multiple curiosities. 
most people don't realize this because when they when I say Tom, tell me about a passionate athlete, you're like, well, here's LeBron James windmill dunking, scowling, you know, over three defenders, and that's what you think of, and you forget that passion on the front end is like a little kid in a driveway shooting balls through a hoop. That's what passion looks like on the front end. Does not look like what we think it looks like, and when we compare ourselves to the end result, that's really demotivating and not going to work very well. But Pat, curiosity, and there's, I mean, I can, I will, I can give your listeners passionrecipe.com, which is the step process in the book for this. I'm giving it away to anybody for free. So don't just listen to me, go there. You know, we have an interactive PDF takes you through all these steps, but you can, there's the intersection of multiple curiosities. That's passion. Neurochemically, it's more dopamine and more, uh, uh, nor, nor epinephrine, just a lot more. The next step is once you know what you're passionate about, you want purpose. You want us to attach that passion to a cause greater than yourself. There's lots of peak performance reasons why, but at an neurochemical level, you start getting more feel good, powerful drugs, oxytocin, endorphins, right? Blah, blah, blah. And then once you have your purpose, well, then what do you need? You need the freedom to pursue your purpose. You need autonomy. That's your next big intrinsic motivator. And once you have oh, I've got, I've got the freedom to explore my purpose, you need mastery, the skills to explore that purpose well. These are the big five intrinsic motivators. There are others, right? Um, but these are the big main five. They give us the most neurochemical reward, and they're literally designed to work in that sequence. And if you get them all right, they all do double duties as flow triggers. So flow, state of optimal performance, we can go into more depth if you want, but let's for optimal performance right now, Flow follows focus. It only shows up when all of our attention is in the right here, right now. So all of flow's triggers drive attention into the now. They do this by increasing mostly focusing chemicals like norepinephrine and dopamine do a couple other things, but that's not important. The point is all these things, curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, mastery, they're all flow triggers. On their own, you'll get a little bit of like neurochemicals, maybe not enough to put you in the state, but when you get them all in a row, you're doing your work and it's flow 60, 70, 80% of the time. And since the uptick on performance and flow is so enormous, so huge that not only, I mean, along the way, anytime you have any of these things, you're getting so much more work done for free, right? You're getting farther, faster. And by the way, once you get all your intrinsic motivators, right, lined up, you know exactly, I've got skills for mastery. Cool. What do you do next? You need goals. Where the hell am I going? And the biology says you need three sets of goals, a mission statement for your life, a series of high, hard goals. Like I want to be a great writer is my mission statement. I want to write a book on cooking. I want to write a book on anime. I want to write a book on Batman. I want to write a book, right? Take, I'm just, I'm Kaiser Sozang you. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, those are your high, hard goals. And then you underneath that, you need clear goals. What am I going to do today? Precisely. And then it goes on from there. My point is that's a system. That's the biology. And when I say like you need three levels of goals, we are goal directed creatures. We have a giant, like we're either sort of shaped by our fears or our goals. If you want to like that's that's sort of what drive how human beings work at a really basic level. So the biology of goal setting is amazing. Like you get your high hard goals, right? You can get an 11 to 25% boost in motivation simply by setting the right kind of goals. And that's if in eight, you're working an eight hour day, that's your baseline. That's like two free hours of work. Give, give people the idea around what a high hard goal is. A high hard goal is exactly what I said. If, if my mission statement purpose is I want to be a great writer or I want to end world hunger, let's say it's I want to end world hunger, then my high hard goals is I want to become a vertical farming expert. I want to learn everything I can about restorative, sustainable agriculture. I Isn't want part of the to... definition, though, that it needs to be like within your reach, but hard so that you not, want some... Not right. Out of the mission statement, right? Mission statement goal, that's a... The high hard goals should be within your reach, but they should be like one to five year timelines within your reach is how I think about them. Different people sort of put different time horizons on them. 
Um, what this research shows is one to five years. I find personally with the rate of change in society and all the other work I do with Peter and all that stuff, I find I can't set high, hard goals that are farther than three years in the future because so much is changing mm -hmm. that I, so I, that's the window that I, I have started working in recently. Um, but I, again, you also have to figure out what's right for you in that one, I think. Um, and yes, but it's gotta be attainable. And the whole point is, um, you have to break them down. If it's not, if you can't wrap your head around and believe it's attainable, break it into chunks until the chunks are attainable, right? And those are your high, hard goals. Part of what I find so intoxicating about your work and just like the space of peak performance is, you know, going back to where we started. So most people are living a really sort of shitty version of what their life could be. They're not pushing themselves. They're not setting high, hard goals. They're not making big demands of themselves. They're never finding out what they're actually capable of doing. And so, look, I get it. Personality doesn't scale. But so my obsession is with what I call the physics of being human, um, what you would refer to as the biology. There are just some things that are true. They are universal. And I will postulate that doing hard things is universal, that there is some wiring in you to make sure that you went out and hunted and faced getting gored by something oh, yeah, or no. raising kids. Like you've got to be willing no, to do hard totally, shit. Yeah, no, I mean like when I say like, when I literally we are hardwired to go big and not going big is bad for us, like flat out. And we all know this. If the, here's, I always I say this at the beginning of the book and I really believe this is true. Um, I think the only thing harder than trying to is the, uh, than the sort of the agony of trying to chase down your dreams is the agony of not chasing down any of them. It is so much more. I kind of figure it's, it's the way if I was being darker or more blunt or more punk rock, I would say, look, it sucks here. It sucks here for everybody. It doesn't matter. It's called life. It's just hard here. It's unpleasant. It's going to be unpleasant, but it's going to, suck whether or not you're trying to be Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, or you sit in front of the TV and watch reruns of Castle, right? The what same makes it suck, suck Mr. Cotter? I don't even think it's, I don't think it sucks. I just think there's like a, I just think it's hard. It is, I think life itself is You said difficult. the agony of chasing your goals. Yeah, I mean like, Tom, you've done really hard shit in your life. The joy of life is doing hard shit. The joy of life is realizing that, oh my God, what I mean by meaning and purpose and 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 when and we all know this. Think back on your life and what are the, my favorite things that I've ever done that mean the matter. They're never shit that you were given that accidentally popped into your life. That the stuff you worked really hard for, right? Like. Uh, that for me, that list, like my marriage, I've been married for 15 years. Being married for 15 years is hard freaking work. You know what I mean? And really, that's a diff that's a difficult kind of one. In the book, I talk about the difference between capital I and small I and possible. Marriages are small I and possible to get right, right? It's There's no clear gap bit point between A and B. And statistically, right now, pretty shitty odds of success, right? right? Marriage right now, you're 50%. Um, odds of success, and that's a, that's a, they're a little better than a lot of the other impossibles. But yeah, the notion of not going after big things is hard for you. Really, I resonate with that a lot. I think though that you're right that pursuing that stuff there is an agony to it. There's also an ecstasy, and yeah. the the ability to vacillate to ride the waves of like fuck this really sucks and I just failed at something and it mattered. And it doesn't have to be a broken bone, but it's like, you know, I really went after something and you've got the high of that. And then, you know, like take your own context. Some of what you've written has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Like that's insanity. But then I'm sure there were other books where you were banging your head against the wall um, and they didn't go where you wanted them to go. And so, or just like oh, a shitty review. There are books that were nominated for Pulitzer Prizes that like, and one of the books that got nominated for the Pulitzer Prize was the hardest thing I've ever done in every Every word sucked. <laughs> I mean, literally, I've never had that experience. I didn't know you could have that experience. I had that experience. Um, now, but, what did uh, it suck? Because it was forcing you to confront your sort of limitations. That it was like no, everything it, was it, just. It. Uh, I had. It was. Uh, I was co-writing the book with somebody that was very difficult to work with. I had an editor that did not trust the subject matter at all. 
like the book was nominated for a Pulitzer by the publisher, but one month before it came out, the editor called me up without my co-writer on the phone and said, if you don't rewrite this entire book right now, I won't publish it. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Like it was heavy. They hated it. They thought it was wrong. They were scared by the subject matter, blah, blah, blah. How'd well, you gonna, deal with that? Can, um, can we talk about what book? I mean, there's only so many books no, you've written that have been yeah, nominated. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we're all just right. Gonna we'll look that up afterwards, but yeah, I want to. I, I, I want to better I understand. Said too much, but it was the problem. No, no, no but I so we'll we'll make it about you. Was, I want to know how you deal with that. How do you deal? How do you stay like confident? Because this is something everybody can relate to. You believed in something. You have put the effort in, the energy, but then external forces are like, no, 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 it's crap. And so, in that moment, uh, most yeah, people yeah. break. No, no, no. So I, so one, I've written a bunch of books, and I've gotten. I come out of one. I come out of the school of journal. I'm a journalist, and I, that was where I was trained. And editors are the most merciless, mean people you've ever. They they're super overworked. They have narcissistic, lunatic bosses often, um, who uh, start magazines, and they have incredibly high standards and no time. And they are. They say some of the Example, I once spent three, four months living in a swamp in the Everglades reporting a story where the only place to get food was a really dark, evil strip club in the middle of the swamp that, like, it was the only place you could get food. And I was out there for three months reporting this story. I wrote it. I turned it in. Um, my editor called me up and uh, – the editor is, by the way, a very good friend of mine and still to this day called me up. He's like, Stephen, by the way, it took me three months to report the story and five months or six months to write it. So I'm nine months in and um, and I'm desperate for the money, by the way, at this point. I'm really poor and I need to get paid. This story is going on. Editor calls me up and he's like, Stephen, there's just one thing I don't understand. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm so damn good. I get like one thing. Cool. What do you got, man? Hit me. He's like, yeah, man every motherfucking word you wrote and (laughs) no shit, no kidding. And uh, like start over. And so what I've learned all along is the following as a general, if you think the person you're talking to has an opinion that is at all of merit, if you think they're, you know, and I think most people in general are, are fairly smart, especially, willing to give them the benefit of the doubt on a lot of this stuff. So what I always say is usually when somebody tells you something is shitty, the thing they're telling you is shitty. Like what they're pointing at, they're probably wrong about. But the fact that it is creating this, something's wrong and it's making them, you trust that shitty feeling. You don't trust why they think it's shitty is what I've learned. So Um, the, when the editor came to me and said, rewrite it, she wasn't wrong. We were, it was a very hard book besides the fact that we were butting heads and we had different ideas about where it should go and how it should go. It was trying to do a lot of things. I was trying to write. Um, I always try to write above my head, but this one was, I was writing farther above my head, meaning the fact density in a normal book of mine is one to two facts per sentence or paragraph. This was like sometimes three to four facts a sentence. Whoa. That's a harder thing to do, right? And not lose your readers, not bore people. So it's technically challenging. And we had not taken it to the level of, it was all there, at, but it wasn't fun yet. And that's actually like often the final thing you have to do. You have to get it all there in the right order and it still doesn't sing. And then you do one final massive polish that is usually you think you've got a 10% polish and you've got like a 40% polish and it's Herculean and impossible and you, you know, it's awful, but that's what it needs. And when you do it, you're like, Oh crap, this is right. Like this is right. And, um, we got it right. I mean, it, it worked. And, um, the editor has yet to apologize, by the way. I like I was, we were nominated for a Pulitzer. It's an international bestseller. You'd think I'd get to be like, Hey, I was sorry about that. Maybe I was wrong. But... Yeah. People definitely have a hard time with that. Um, do you have like uh, I only take books where I'm really confident in the subject matter or uh, um, because you know, it's so easy to be swayed by external forces when you don't have a strong sense of what something is. 
and writing is such a sort of naked art form where you're really putting yourself out there to get to get knocked around. And I'm just wondering, you know, for if you think of a, a sort of beginning writer listening to this, what is how do you create that stability of the idea to weather the storms where you can go, OK, cool, there's a problem. They're probably wrong about how to fix it. But I know what this idea is. I have the confidence to, to keep going and I'll further contextualize this. You've often said that in the beginning, you may only get three to 500 words a day, but by the end, when you've really found the book, you're at like 1,400 words a day. So obviously there's a phase where the idea is quite delicate and like maybe you haven't quite found it. What advice do you have for people that, you know, they're creating something artistically and it is very possible that other people will knock them off what they're trying to do? Mm. So... I mean, the really long answer to that question is found in Flow for Writers, which is the whole, right, the, the class I built about this. So there's no short answer. But I'll give you some stuff that we talk about in The Art of Impossible that applies to sort of creativity in general and definitely book writing. That's some high percentage, probably over 50 of writer's block, of any kind of creative block, is you don't know your starts and your endings. Earlier I said we are goal-directed machines, I'm not like that's not a figure of speech. The brain has a built in pattern recognition system. It links ideas together automatically. If you give it a place to start and you know where you're going, if you can pay attention, you will get like it will find all the steps in between. Goal setting is both about driving motivation and filtering reality. Our goals filter our reality. When you don't have goal set property, you will not notice the op the opportunities won't like you literally won't see them for neurobiological reasons we can go into. Um, but it works the same with creativity, right? You got to know where you're going. Think about like the simple example, the one that everybody can kind of get is we've all ridden a bike. When you ride a bike, you don't really s steer for where you are. You look. 30 feet ahead, right? Mountain bikers are taught to look 30 feet down the trailer. When your mom taught you how to ride a bike, look in front of you, don't look down at your tires, right? Because we get, we're literally as biological beings built to go where we look, right? If you've ever surfed and tried to surf a tube, you cannot surf a tube. Everything is moving way too fast. You have to look yourself through the tube. You pull into that wave, you peg your eyes to the end of the hole, and that's how you get there. When you walk a balance beam or a slack line, you put your eyes on the end of the thing and that's how you get there. You can't actually steer consciously. We steer with by, visually by where we go. This is why visualization as a, as a performance technique actually works. Same, it's the same system. These are all parts of the same system. And knowing your ending. So my point on this is I have an outline. I, um, I have a general belief that I am not all that special. Meaning if I'm really interested in something, a bunch of other people probably are too. That's just my general thesis is like, if I find this interesting, I'm not all that special. A bunch of other people are too. So I, if I can accurately communicate what it is that I find so damn fascinating and I'm willing to give 10 years of my life to it, I think there's a whole bunch of other people who go, Oh yeah, that's cool. I want to, I'll read about that. You know what I mean? So that's the, my modus operandi. I trust my instincts and I've had the advantage of, I've had been having instincts like that in public for decades. I would pitch editors five ideas at a time. They would say four sucks, do this one. Right. And over and over and over and over again. So I've, you know, I've gotten, I trust, I trust at this point, you know what I mean? And at a certain point, when you move transition from being a journalist to being a book writer, you just sort of have to go, okay, I God, I hope people like my words because like I'm trying to turn words into money. That's the sort of the job. You know what I mean? Like we can make it all fancy and call it art and all, but like at a really basic level, I'm turning words into money, and that only works if I is if I write compelling, interesting words. And at a certain point, you have to just trust it. There's something that you in there about the notion of turning words into money that reminded me of what we were talking about right before we started rolling, which is this idea that your early 20s is this utterly fascinating period in your life. 
And I think what I'm queuing off of is, is sort of how you end up in that position where you're turning words into money. Um, and you were talking about um, Antimatter, a sort of visual arts collective that you were a part of or started um, in your early 20s and living in like a super dicey area in San Francisco. What is it about those sort of early formative years? Um, I, I think they're incredibly important to the artist, somebody that will will become. I don't know. Maybe you don't think that or maybe you do. But do you think anything is special about that period? And if so, what is it? Uh, I don't know if anything is more like there's something special about that period. There's really something special about your thirties and your forties. I mean, like there's adult development sort of follows a, right. A, a, a set set of patterns, but I do think you're right in that. Um, I was around a lot of people who, um, you had to be a little bit of a dreamer. I was around like artists and entrepreneurs essentially. And both are, you know, people who are sort of chasing the impossible a little bit. And by the way, action sport athletes who suddenly decided they were going to try to get paid for action sports. Like nobody in the history of the world had ever gotten paid as an action sport athlete, right? They didn't have sponsors. We weren't even like full fledged members of society, right? Skateboarding was a crime. And like, you know what I mean? Like people forget how punk rock that stuff really was, but it was, it was not really, you know, surf bombs, ski bombs. These were not, you know, it changed after the X Games and the Gravy Games and people started to get sponsors. But I was part of the generation that sort of solved that puzzle mm. and figured that out. So you, all the people around me were sort of like betting on themselves against really impossible odds and often in the face of culture and society. Get back to the Nietzsche idea we started with, right? Um, that's what really I think that's one of the things that shaped me is, you know, as I said, my, my level of risk tolerance, but my level of like what's possible in this life. I always say that, like, I was living in and around Squaw Valley in the early 90s. I was 22, 23, like after antimatter. Right. And coming out of that period when I was living at the largest performance and video house and people were getting famous, like, you know, people were getting shows at major um galleries and then made and museums and things like that uh, so like i was watching people really succeed um but even with the action sport athletes like you have to understand that it's like you go out drinking with your friends on you know it's friday night you go drinking with your friends everybody gets hammered everybody does the same stupid shit we all go home and you wake up in the morning and those same friends do something that's never been done before in the history of humanity and for all recorded history we believed was impossible. That's a very weird thing, right? Peter Diamandis was one of my close friends. He wanted to unlock the space frontier and it seemed really possible. The first guy who invented the a flying, uh, it was actually a flying motorcycle, Dejer Molnar, he was a friend. I was the first guy who ever saw the blueprints. He like barged into my apartment in LA one time and like spread them out. He's like, look, I've invented a flying motorcycle. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking? You've invented it. It turns out. Yeah, actually. So this was that kind of world. And it was, it was very hard to figure out where, like what's possible. Where are the limits? Like we're not supposed to be, we're supposed to be punk rockers. We're supposed to be dead before we're 30. Like that was the crowd. We're not supposed to be redefining the limits of human possibility. And sort of, this was also the 90s. So you got to remember that like the weird punk rockers took over music, took over magazines, like all of a sudden, like this really weird group of outsiders, um, we were in charge, right? Like Nirvana released an album, a couple other things happened. And, you know, suddenly you could self-publish, you couldn't self-publish, but the tools of publishing were no longer million dollar tools. They were things that people could afford. And suddenly you could challenge big major magazines. You didn't have to, right? And I was part of all of that. So the possibility space um, was really open. So the 20s were amazing that way. It was very hard though, is like everybody else. The 30s are when reality set in, sets in always across the board. So like, I think one of the big differences between me and almost everybody else I knew is um, I just never gave up on that idea. Like I think everybody, a lot of people I knew, I watched them making choices and I was like, well, that's, it's cool that you bought that great house, 
but now you've got a mortgage. And with a mortgage, you're locked into certain decisions or now you're, you're married and have a baby and now you're locked into certain decisions and that may be cool, but it is also limiting, you know, peak performance stuff. And I mean, you know, yeah, this is getting into good, why bad, I think but... the the 20s or the early 20s, especially is such a magical period. You talk in the book really profoundly about creativity and the things that sort of lead to creativity. And one of the things you talk about is like the ability to do pattern recognition from sort of oblique angles. But that if you want to recognize those patterns, you must encounter a lot of patterns. So in your early 20s, being poor is okay, first of all. People don't have a lot of the responsibilities. They're not tied down by kids. They're not tied down by a mortgage. And they don't have all the preconceived notions. A lot of the things that you think are impossible are things that you learn over time that are impossible because you watch somebody else fall. You get hurt. You break a bone. The world tells you, you know, that that's not going to work. And in your early 20s, you're sort of still in that phase where you haven't given up like you're talking about. You don't have the huge responsibilities. You haven't broken all the bones yet. And so people will, in that sort of drinking in the world, um, to begin to have the patterns that they will recognize later that they'll monetize, right? Like looking back at people in the early 20s, they just seem like a chaotic mess. Like it, it is, I do not romanticize it, right? They look like a fucking mess. But... When I was in it, I remember thinking that I was as old as I was ever going to be, that I had everything figured out. The world just seemed incredibly open. Oh, God, somebody, there's a quote. Please tell me you know who said this. It's something like, when you're young, the world is literally infinite. You could become anything. But then at some point, like, it starts narrowing down until you yeah. are a very specific person. Well, so, you know, the quote, we, you started with the habit of inferiority, the James quote. In the book, I say, look, there's a modern version written by the screenwriter Charlie Kaufman that opens Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, um, the movie that George Clooney made, the Chuck Berry story, which to me is one of the more devastating, heartbreaking quotes in the world, which is when you're young, your potential is infinite. You could be anything, really. You could be Einstein. You might be DiMaggio. And then you get to an age when what you might be gives way to what you have been. You weren't Einstein. You weren't anything. That's a bad moment. Now, some people hear that and they're like, screw you, Stephen, man. I'm just trying to be, right? I'm just trying to get through Monday. Um, I don't need to become anything. I and Okay. That's like, sure. And in that case, go read Art Impossible to make Monday easier for you. You know what I mean? But like, I don't believe you, honestly. Like most people came to do something. Mm -hmm. And if they knew there was a blueprint and they knew, like, you know, hey, wait, this is really within the realm of possibility for me, they'd go for it. And that's what I think is true. Well, we're speaking of devastating quotes tied to this idea of the world being more infinite when you're young. There is a quote that haunts me. I think about it not every day, but damn it, it's close. Genius is a young man's game. And I hate that quote. Because as a late bloomer, I, I just don't want it to be true, right? I want to yeah, feel I, like my I, best days are always I in think, front of me. I think that's totally cr cr that it's crap. And um, I can, by the way, so there's a great book that'll, like, one book that'll solve your problem. Go read uh, The Wisdom Paradox by a neuroscientist named Elkanon Goldberg. And funny, I'll just. Greatest name Elk ever. Elkanon? Elkanon? Elkanon Goldberg. He's Israeli, but now teaches at NYU. But this is a little before your time, I think, but it, like, Interesting. So the book's about what is wisdom, but he set out to solve this really weird puzzle. Reagan, when Reagan was president, his second term, but when after his presidency, it was very clear he had Alzheimer's, right? And so he was, for at least two, if not three years, was governing the most powerful nation on earth with Alzheimer's. And so Elkanon asked himself, how is this even possible? Like, sure, people were helping, you know what I mean? But like, he was still in charge and he wanted to know, how is this? from a biological neurobiology, how is this possible? And so he wrote a book about where, what's the, the neurobiology of, of wisdom and it is, and where it comes from. And I don't, like genius is that they stat, when they say genius whoa, 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 is a You gotta give game. us the punchline of, of the wisdom paradox. So where oh, does it so come from? Well, we, we're, pattern recognition. Interesting. You, you, I mean, you, it's, if, if you can lay in, the brain is, it works by associations, right? It makes associations. So, if you can fill it with enough rich connections and associations and habituate them, his point with Reagan is 
the guy had habituated so many high level programs that he could execute automatically that literally like he could like, oh, it's statesman mode time, cool, and click in, it's just automatic. And you've seen this, you've been around, it's fairly common with a certain breed of thought leaders where they've just, they've been in front of the microphone too long and they like, you ask them a question, they just slap into like, I'm gonna give you robo answer right it's now. what like I call the loop. That. Right, yep. the loop. So you've seen that. Um, Reagan just had more loops and higher level loops than a lot of people because of you know he, his level of experience that, but that was Alcanon's point. But this is how we all learn, and that doesn't change, right? Genius is cumulative, and they always like when you actually look at um, some of the really good books on creative genius and where we comes from and what do we know, and sort of this is tangential to that idea I talked about long haul creativity. So there's a lot of this work that's been done. They always point out geniuses have a couple things in common. One is they produce an enormous amount of shit, right? Like just stuff. You just produce a lot. And 70% of it is crap, but 30% is freaking genius. And you know, right, that's a commonality throughout history. It shows up everywhere. Um, so while quality is there, there's also a quantity to it. And as you know, quantity increases over time. What they were talking about though was the calcification of imagination that does occur as you get older. And that's that's real for a lot of neurobiological ways, but it's also completely defeatable. Like you don't have to get stuck that way. In fact, the art of impossible, like the stuff on creativity and long haul creativity is essentially a formula for, hey, here's how you keep developing your creative problem solving skills and don't calcify. But you know, I break, don't, break I that don't down think. for me because one, that term is magical. The calcification of imagination is very evocative. How do we avoid that? Well, I mean, you know, easy way, hire a lot of people across a bunch of different ages or work with people from a bunch of different ages and a bunch of different cultures. Why would that work? Because what happens as, so as we get older, um, we gain more and more and more expertise on sort of how we like to live, how who we are, how we like to live, and what we know in the world. And we take in less new information because we think we have all the right ideas. And that's fine. There's some great expertise there, but you can, that's not how imagination requires novelty. Creativity is a recombinatory process. We can go deeper, but at a simple level, your brain notices something new, it finds something old, it connects the dots, and it bursts something completely novel. That's how creativity works. And that middle step is pattern recognition, right? But you gotta feed it something novel. So if you're not taking in the novel, you've got a problem. And if you're getting older and all the people around you are your age and look like you, you have no access to novelty. Also, even made worse by the fact that people stopped reading novels. Novels are novel. Like they literally give you somebody else's perspective. They're designed to shift your head sideways and say, hey man, your view of reality might be totally accurate, but somebody else is right here. They got another view, it's totally different, and they're, they think theirs is totally accurate. And I don't know who's right, but just so you know, right? And I like, I. I read novels for that reason, and I also like to have people who are a lot older than me, you know, working in my company, and people who are a lot younger than me working in my company. Um, I I like to surround myself with smart people who disagree with me, and you know, and I, you know, I always say as a journalist, you're taught that the best room to be in is the room where you're the dumbest. How do you navigate that though? So this is the um, the Abraham Lincoln idea of a team of rivals, which I'm obsessed with. I'm the same as you. I want people to disagree, but it is not easy to orchestrate that disagreement without it turning into dysfunction. So do you have any insights there? Yeah, I, I so um, let us say that The Art of Impossible is a book that is very much focused on individual peak performance. There is some team stuff in there. You're getting into leadership and, and team questions, and I have knowledge. I don't necessarily know if I have expertise. And I don't mind you stuff. popping off. I'm just yeah, like no, in I'm, terms I, of no, I just have to, this is just stuff. I, man, I don't know. 
I mean, like, I don't like I'll give you a really freaking simple example from the past couple of days. My wife, who I love to death and is amazing, and she like she's doing her job when she says this. She's like, look, man, you think you're really funny and you are, but you've got to be careful because you pay people and the people you're editing with, like, are they laughing because it's funny or are they laughing because you're paying them? And until you know, be careful with this stuff because blah, blah, blah. She's not wrong about that stuff. And I was, so I was talking to literally like a bunch of people I'm working on a big project with on my staff about this very thing. We're creating content together. And I was like, look, you guys are laughing and I can't tell if you're laughing because this is funny or you're laughing because you think you have to be laughing or you're laughing because you can't believe that Stephen would consider doing this. He must be out of his fucking mind, right? Like, it's one of the three. And I was literally talking about a step, and I was like, I don't know which one to trust. And I've had, my wife wasn't saying anything I wasn't already feeling. You know what I mean? She was like, hey, man, the reason this is irking you is because of, and I mean, I like the fact, I think I work with some of the greatest people in the world who are my friends, but it doesn't change the fact that like 60 people work for me. And, you know, I'm excited that they get to do what they've always wanted to do for a living. And I can sort of make, help make that happen. But it's a fair point. And I don't know how, that's a difficult challenge for me to solve. I'm not sure what the answer is to that particular one is my, is my answer. That's as honest I can, I can be, cause I really don't like I, this is, live and learn when it comes to like team management stuff, right? And leadership stuff for me. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's live and learn for everybody that's in the middle of it. But whenever you own a company, it's like, well, you have to do something. You've got to be making decisions every day. And getting people to talk to power is brutally difficult. It's one of the things that I actively hire for. I'm looking for people, yeah, even just I, in the interview process. I, I mean, I like to hire ex-journalists for a lot of different reasons. I personally believe that if you can write a 10,000 word article, you have most of the skills you need to succeed in business and almost everything else I can teach you, depending on where, where I need to push you, because there's so much that sort of comes baked into that particular one. But journalists have some of that stuff built in as well. Like they are, I was paid, A, I was an old punk rocker. Right. B, I was a magician. And like magicians, I was around the best in the world. Like literally, like you'd hang out a magic store and the biggest names in the world, the guys who were on Broadway or in Vegas who were making millions of dollars at it, would come in and stand around and do card tricks with the 13 year old, 12 year old kids. Like that How was How long just, did you stay practicing I magic? Started, I started working when I was 10 and I sort of started to phase out around the time I was 17 because I started to realize that, honestly, to be great at magic, and I don't like to do anything that I can't be great at, you have to like lying to people. Ultimately, you have to like that. You have to like conning people or fooling people. Like that has to be part of the thrill for you, getting over in that way. And that's actually not a thrill for me. Like it wasn't natural and it was too, I, it, I was, you know, I didn't, it turns out that I like I liked part of the equation. It was the same reason like I played around kind of a lot of theater and did a lot more theater than most people ever do. But it, again, it wasn't like it wasn't the right fit for me. I ended up, you know, in a performance in an art video gallery because I thought maybe performance art would work and it didn't. Like it turns out like when I wrote my first book and got up on stage and started talking about like the ideas that I was actually interested in writing about, that was the right fit. And I was like, oh, this one fits. I can do this thing. Those other things weren't quite right, even though the urges were pointing in the same direction. The fit was wrong. What was some of the like craziest performance art that either you did or you've seen done? The, I, hard to say. I mean, I so like you have, this is the same crowd that created Bernie. I mean, the survival research labs shows like the one that was under the bay bridge where they like afterwards i don't even think they're allowed to perform in california anymore <laughs> i think like um you got to remember that like long before there were robo wars or burning man or any of that stuff there was this group of crazy artists led by a guy named mark pauline um who had nine fingers because he blew one off in a crazy accident doing building they would build like sonic death cannons out of jet engines that fired sonic air and they would build 90 foot flamethrowers and 100 foot robots that would do battle 
underneath the Bay Bridge. There was literally three places in the world they could perform, and you had to sign waivers and take your life in your hands to attack. You can look up survival research labs on online, but like they were huge. These were a lot of the people who ended up be building Burning Man, all the art cars and all that stuff. Same, this is the DNA. This is where it came from. And they were all sort of like mad rocket science geniuses um, coming sort of out of Southern California, Orange County rocket science aerospace world and like started to use that knowledge to do things like build surfboards. And then what do they do in their free time? They build death robots that, you know what I mean? That was sort of the culture, but like if you look early action sports was a lot of crossover out of the aerospace community. Where do you think those materials came from for surfboards and skis and like, so there was this weird, you know, and this was all San Francisco. So there was a lot of proto Silicon Valley, early V, this was the wor world of early VR with Jared Lanier and the, the you know, that was that, that kind of world. And so survival research labs, I saw Scozy Fetish, which was mini survival research labs. They played in our living room or at, at Antimatter, which was like having their burning man. Thing. No, they were uh, they were a they were a noise band that played things like chainsaws and oil drums and destroying a, ch a car with a sledgehammer um, and maybe a little guitar, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, while they had death robots fighting it out on stage with them. Um, Guar came out of this whole same scene. If you've ever heard of the metal band, I've heard Guar. of Guar, but this noise band is well outside of anything that I've experienced with. I don't believe that because there's a, there's actually crossover with like early anime, like the some of the stuff you're into, it's coming coming out of uh, out of Japan, crossed into some of the early noise industrial. I mean, this was Nine Inch Nails came out of this. Sit like later on in this progression, Marilyn Manson is a couple like same lineage, just a bunch of steps down. Those guys I dig, but there's definitely melodies and things. I'm far more drawn to the okay. ones that sound like songs and not the ones that sound like a piece of equipment but, breaking. Yeah, but, yeah, by the way, I have to tell you, the spectacle was amazing. The spectacle was astounding. There were people I knew who who like would listen to it as if it was like music or something like I was like this dude is like torturing live animals is what it sounds like and that's not like I don't want to listen to that I want to watch it because the spectacle is amazing and I can't like there was really amazing creativity in it like it sounds like but it was really well done and well orchestrated and thought out and interesting um at the time also like when you're 18 19 20 21 22 um and you haven't seen as much spectacle and in, in the world before, like, you got to also remember, I didn't grow up in a world with the internet. I didn't grow up in the world with, I was grew up in Cleveland before there was cable TV there. You know what I mean? We had three channels. New York culture would sort of arrive in Cleveland like eight months late or eight months before it was like bands would show up, show up to play where I grew up in Cleveland. Um, I, I saw everybody in like these, you two would come to play a giant, you know, American tour and they would come to Cleveland first because like, who cares? It's freaking Cleveland. So we'll warm up there. We'll screw it all up and then we'll go to the rest of the world. So we either got culture like a couple years later or we got bad culture like early because people wanted to test the market. That's hilarious. When I think about some of the sort of ultra creative out of the box thinkers that you're describing here, people that make big battle robots before it's a thing, people that are turning chainsaws and flamethrowers into music ish. Um, it reminds me of the part in the book where you actually say, actually maybe what you need is to think inside the box. You put forward some yeah, counterintuitive so. ideas around, you know, what creativity is and how to hack creativity. Um, how do yeah, we by the hack way, creativity? Yeah, we you, we covered that. So th I earlier I said, know your starts and your endings, right? That's a form of this. There is the reason the blank page is so awful is we're not we're actually built to be creative, sort of inside the box. It's much better 
We're much freer for a, a lot of ways. Um, the brain We're just- freer with restrictions. With freer with restrictions. It's easier to be, cre- it, but that takes a little while. Because uh, it gives s- us the the light at the end of the surf tube to look at and point our eyes at? Is that like, how does that well, generate it lim- freedom? It limits the possibility space. The possibility space is too big when you can go anywhere. It's, you can literally go anywhere. And what are my choices? How do I pick? Right. When I have it, the, I used to you, like it's like when I choose to start a chapter, I used to get really I care more about the first line than I care about anything because it's where like it's my start and I got to get it right. But I that used to cripple me. And then I realized that, like, no, just start. Like, I'll give you a simple example. I write in layers. So my first pass is literally who, what, where, why, when, who, what, where, why, when. My second pass are all the sort of like plot points that have to come. So who, well, where does he live? And what colors his hair? And what is it, right? Like those, that kind of shit. And the art gets added on last. And I, and I do it. Are you it talking about I, when writing fiction or nonfiction as well? When writing anything. Anything you've ever read of mine for the past 20 years or so, I write in layers. And I do that because the limit of the who, what, where, why um, is it once it's in place, then the art can be free. If I try to start with the style and I want to start with the art and the flair and the whatever, I am making it, I'm locking myself into a position that I don't know if I want to be locked into. Like if I want to communicate, getting what I need to communicate out first before I layer the art in works better for me because the art shackles it completely down to one way. I don't know if I'm making any sense there, but there's a, there's a tremendous amount of uh, research that basically says, you know, if I say, Tom, create a funny sketch for me, go, you got two minutes, you're going to get stuck. But if I'm like, Tom, okay, I need, I need a funny sketch. I need uh, Superman meets Wonder Woman in a Bayou Cantina. And what's the f- talk, talk, right? Suddenly, you can actually, your brain is already like, I can just look at you and I know you've got like one or two Superman meets blah, blah, and a cantina ideas floating around your head. I gave you some pre-existing limits. You know how to put these things together in a way that's kind of funny. It's automatic-ish. Your brain is a pattern recognition system and will do that. But if you say, if I just say, dude, just be funny, be, be funny, it's gotta be about mm. superheroes. You're like, what? I don't, there are so many. Yeah, that's right. it's, it's when that people invite me to give talks. I'm always, you know, give me the theme of the event. Uh, have people ask me questions. Like, give me some sort of prompt. And you actually quote a jazz musician, I forget who, in the book, as saying you can't improv Mingus. off of nothing. Darlie Mingus. Yeah, you, you can't in- improv off of nothing. And it's, he's, I think he's totally right. Yeah, that, that makes a lot thing. of sense to me. It's the same thing as? It's the same thing with, like, so I like think about foot football is a really great example because for foot play football plays last about seven to eight seconds, nine seconds. Um, and for the first six seconds or so you have a job to do, right? Bill Belichick, do your job. Well, that job actually is going to last about six seconds. And then if the play is still going, it's cause either somebody doing something good or the play has broken down and you're freestyling and you've got four seconds to be a creative genius. And that's what makes football so challenging is because you have to play color completely with the, in the lines for the first half of the play and then be an improvisational genius for the second half of the play. And that's a really like that's a really strange thing for Same people to, to learn how to do. It's really hard. And it's also it's a very it's a very flowy game but only if you get enough repetitions and being that it's contact sport and super violent, it's hard, right? Like it's, it's, it's got a bunch of really interesting limiting factors that make football a very interesting sort of like, I like watching it for like the creative puzzle solving of like, they're trying to create limit. And what, when a coach is creating plays, he's creating limits. He's saying, look, this is the play. This is what we're going to try to do. But if it doesn't work, I'm setting it up. These are the bounds and you freestyle inside of it. Because if you freestyle outside of it, the quarterback is going to have no freaking clue where to 
throw the ball, but I'm giving you limits, freestyle inside these limits, and we can find you kind of thing. Mm. That's an example that everybody can kind of wrap their head around, all the males who like football, or all the people who like football. Um, sorry, I grew up in a world where women didn't really like football. Now women like football, and I love that. <laughs> that makes me a lot happier. Yeah, no joke. Uh, I want to talk about creativity, how we expand it, drugs, and how it plays in. In the book, you give an example, which, of course, I thought the punchline would be that drinking messes up your creativity. But you actually give an example of there is like a sweet spot right below, or at least this is what they tested, right below the legal limit. And they were able to solve word puzzles faster and with more answers than people who uh, were sober, which I was very surprised. And how far does that extrapolate? So uh, with which question do you want first? Do I, you want booze or creativity first? Uh, well, in the book, you were talking about booze as it ties to creativity. Yeah, so what no, I'm trying to figure out is how do I... Two questions. Do you want me to answer the booze question first or the creativity question first? Go, go with creativity. Okay. So um, one thing that's worth knowing, the part of the brain that finds farther flung associations between ideas appears to be uh, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Don't worry about that. That's just a fancy name for like, this is where it is, right? In the brain. That's what it, and, and what it looks like. But I'll ignore that. What we know is that when the more anxiety in your system, the more logical and linear your brain wants to be. And the extreme example that everybody is going to go, oh, wow, I didn't think of it that way, is fight or flight. When you're facing a really big challenge, your brain says, no, 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 you should not have lots of options. You'll die. We're going to give you two. You can fight or you can run, right? Those are your choices. You can actually freeze. There's three, but like fight, freeze, and flee is less sexy than fight or flight. So people leave it out. But like literally, that's, that's not just at the extreme. That's every step along the way. So the more fear, the more anxiety the less creativity. Your brain wants logical, linear, safe solutions. The less anxiety, the, and, and, and booze, uh, low, uh, they didn't get people drunk. They took them right up. I think it was right below the legal limit is where they got them, a little, a little tipsy. Um, is um, First of all, you get dopamine from booze, so that's a feel-good drug, so you're in a better mood. We know like being in a good mood is one of the best hacks for creativity, right? For sure, and it's this mechanism. When you're in a good mood, you feel safe and secure, so your brain will find farther flung connections between ideas. Simpler way to do it, by the way, is look at a wide vista and try to look out the corners of your eyes. Your brain goes, oh, when, so when you're anxious, you focus really intently. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at your peripheral vision, your brain goes, oh, well, focus isn't really intense. You must be calm. And it actually activates your parasympathetic nervous system. It calms you down. Um, so a very, if you're looking to calm yourself down really fast, looking out of your peripheral vision seems to be one way to do it. Um, this is not my work. This is Dr. Andrew Huberman's work at Stanford. We do some work with him. This is, this is stuff you Incredible he wants, dude. So. I love that guy. Yeah. Andrew's great. Um, so uh, same thing. So one booze puts you in a in a better mood and two so dopamine neurochemicals are the brain communicates in two ways right electrical signals chemical signals and um neurochemicals are multi-tools right they do lots of different jobs in the brain dopamine amplifies focus that's one of the things it does it also rewards any behavior that like has a survival value but Another thing it does is it tunes signal to noise ratios, which is a fancy way of saying it amplifies pattern recognition. So when we have dopamine in our system, we find more connections between stuff. So I'll give you a simple example. One of the things that happens, we get dopamine from insights. If you ever do a Sudoku or a crossword puzzle, get an answer right, that little rush of pleasure you get, that's dopamine. You ever notice if you get like three or four answers right in a row, that's because dopamine you get a rush of dopamine from getting one answer together, pattern recognition, and then because dopamine amplifies pattern recognition, you get a bunch of answers in a row. This is why creative ideas spiral. Well, one idea leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. Right? This is the mechanism underneath all of that. So 
Um, and by the way, turn up the dopamine too much, you have schizophrenia. You start finding patterns where there aren't connections. You get conspiracy. That's interesting. Right? So this is Peter Brueger's work in Switzerland. Beautiful study, crazy study. You'll love this. Took a bunch of uh, people who are, he called them true believers. These are people who believe in conspiracy theories and gods, ghosts, demons, a lot of spiritual, right? That group. And then he took a bunch of skeptics. And then he took a bunch of faces, scrambled some, and kept others as real faces. So you could get like your nose, my eyes, and her ears pushed together. It looks like a real face, but it's not, or you get a real face. And they started showing them these clusters of people. The people who were the conspiracy buffs always saw more real faces where the skeptics said, oh, no, that's fake, that's real. They redid the experiment, and they gave – people dopamine they gave the skeptics l-dopa which is a mm. parkinson's drug it increases the amount of dopamine and some of the skeptics were saying oh no that's a real face that's a Whoa. real face that's a real face yeah so dopamine this is why also like all that when they give l-dopa to people you can suddenly spontaneously develop gambling addiction yes right? i've heard about that that's a love of patterns that's about patterns and reward and whatever but you can also um this happens fairly frequently People have like second, third creative careers. Like they get on L Dopa for Parkinson's mm. and they have like this creative flowering ah, because of this, right? So it's a high, it's a sort of risky. Okay, okay, thing. okay. Hold on. But, so why uh, everybody's going to tell you to do psychedelics if you want to increase your creativity? I microdose psilocybin. It did fuck all for me. It was not interesting in the slightest. Um, why why don't people talk about taking L Dopa? I'm literally gonna get off this call and go yeah, find you, a supply so of L Dopa. I mean, the thing is, first of all, there's you can get it naturally um, better, but you know, or I mean, if you uh, smoke sativa or any uh, any of the marijuanas, does with, uh, nothing for me. That's nothing. Dopamine, no. Lies. That's Vicious lies. Really? The way I'm that saying, I I'm not the, gonna say I'm not saying it, like I'm not saying. Um, you're not your experience is real i'm not doubting your experience i no. mean this is interesting because like i mean most people i mean i'm not saying it's creativity you can use i hate <laughs> like tom, tom i'm not a fan of microdosing and i'm not i wrote stealing fire i i pointed out that yes there's a long history of people using psychedelics for creativity mm. at the flow research collective we are interested in psychological and physiological interventions and not technological or pharmacological. And people ask me why all the time. And I'm like, look, I can, if I was dramatic, I would say, well, back when I was a journalist on five separate occasions, I was shot at. And at no point when somebody was shooting at me was I like, excuse me, sir, would you please put that AK-47 down while I put this EEG headset on and train my brainwaves in alpha so I can dodge your bullets, right? That shit just doesn't happen. Or when the boss says, hey, Tom, get in here. I need the presentation we're going to do next week. I need it now, and I need to do it uh, for my boss and her boss and his boss, and the future of the world depends on it. You don't have time for a substance or the much more familiar example, hey, honey, can I talk to you for a minute, <laughs> right? Like you don't get to say, oh, like let me hold on. Let me get jiggy with all this tech and these substances, and I'll be in, right? Like that's not how reality works. I want tools that can work under any circumstances that are reliable and repeatable. And I'm not um, to say nothing of the fact that like psychic and I've done more psychedelics than, you know, we talked about this last time we were on the air. I've got a long, I did a lot of psychedelics in my twenties um, and I'll still do them every now and again for fun. Um, but I like, I think drugs are fun. I think they can be fun and a good vacation every now and again. I don't think they're worth a damn for insight. People, a lot of people think you can get creativity and insight, and I'm not saying other people can't. I certainly can't. Mm -hmm. It's never worked that way. Same. I've learned one or two things that may or may not be true about the universe, and that's what I've learned. And I've, you know, I've taken, you know, more psychedelics than than most people ever go near. Um, I um and. Okay, interesting. You know what I mean? But like, I went on a giant spiritual quest thinking psychedelics were going to be the answer. And like, one, I ended up an atheist. And two, you know what I mean? Like, I, like I don't know what to tell you, but like, that was my experience. Was it was it I, directly the experience of psilocybin, or I'm sorry, not psilocybin, but psychedelics no, that made you an atheist? It was no, I'm not, and I'm not I'm really actually an agnostic. Um, no, it was. Uh, I don't. Um, 
first of all, I really dislike psychedelic culture. I really like it. The what is it about I, the culture you don't like? So we talked about this in, in, in Stealing Fire a little bit. This is true with flow work. This is one of the dangers. So at the Flow Research Collective, the only swag we have is a T-shirt that says never trust the dopamine. And um, the reason is, and a lot of these drugs amplify dopamine, is that psychedelics and these experiences where your ego vanishes, where there's selflessness, there's a rebound effect. So the, when your ego comes back on, it actually comes on bigger and more ferocious. And people come back from psychedelics, they have visionary experiences and they think they have authority, like some kind of spiritual authority, some kind of create, like, I don't, like, I don't, maybe you do, but I don't, like, I, I've not, I don't think so. I think you, you're experiencing well, well documented, meaning like 10,000 years of documentation, um, ego inflation, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And, you know, we tell at the Flow Research Collective, I we teach people like, literally, if we put you into a flow state, if you get into a flow state, don't go shopping. Pattern recognition is all turned up. Everything looks good, right? Mm -hmm. Don't, uh, and, by, and by the way, there's a lot of like people in the self-help coaching world who think it's perfectly fine to alter people's consciousness and then try to upsell them stuff. And I think it's criminal because when you're in flow, for example, Risk-taking is up and long-term planning is down, right? The flow is great for a lot of stuff. It's not great for long-term planning. Have big dreams in flow. Verify them in reality, right? Like, and this is the same reason the Burning Man ticket says don't make a life-changing decision for six weeks until after the event, right? Never. Really? Six weeks after? Yeah, I think it's six weeks. Maybe it's four weeks. But, like, yeah, they, I mean, they flat-out warn you. Like, this is no dangers. This is not, like... You know what? I, like this is these. This is because people are having a breakthrough. Because I would get while you are high, but six weeks is a long time. So are people are having back. sort of false epiphanies, yeah, or what? They're having false epiphanies. They're having like they're falling in love with somebody who is not their significant other that they meet on the playa, and they think, you know, that the peak experience, like you have to like if you're having a peak experience, that's astounding. But you got to sort of verify and validate in the real world for a while, I think, before you can really trust it. This is I teach my my staff this all the time, and I think this I, this happens in the world. It makes me crazy. The order is supposed to be insight, research, publication, meaning like have other smart people beat on your ideas, then communication. Right? What we have right now in psychedelic culture is insight and communication and there's no research and there's no i did the research here's what i think i'm looking at and hey like here's my ideas smart people beat on them for a while and let me hone this and then let me stand on stage and tell you it's truth instead like people are going insight and then they're jumping to whatever platform they can and they're talking to you as if it's truth that's what i mean by when i say I don't like psychedelic culture that to me is nonsense like just because you're having a crazy mystical experience doesn't like doesn't mean you don't have to still go out and validate it as truth um using the same we you know we have truth filters we have there's a whole bunch of stuff in art and possible well, here's how you evaluate knowledge quickly right you're gonna have to learn you're gonna have to accelerate learning skills and you're gonna need truth filters scientific method is a truth filter investigative journalism the way i was that those are truth filters uh, Elon Musk's first principle thinking that Peter and I talk about in, in bold. These are all, how do I evaluate information quickly? And things like that, when, when engineers wanna know what are the boundary conditions, right? What are the limits? If they, they, what they're saying is everything beyond those limits is where the nonsense or the breakthroughs are. But it's either or, and you just gotta know, right? I'm not saying don't learn the weird ass shit, but know that this is the line, and once you step over this line, it's an open question. Go explore for sure, but like there's a line and like, you know, I was a reporter who specialized in the cutting edge and I, that was the hardest thing to always figure out like, where's the line in this field where I'm not exactly an expert, right? I'd go into like genetics and you have to know, well, this is established truth and this is somebody's wild idea and it may be right, it may be wrong, but like, if you're gonna publish it, you gotta know where the line is just so you can describe it to most people. Like, hey, this is what we know for sure. 
this stuff may or may not be true. You can make up your own mind. Here's here's the way to do that. Um, blah blah blah. That I feel is responsible and smart, and I don't know. That answer your question at all, or did I just go off in some other? No, 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 you did for sure. And uh, I think Truth Filters is a great place to wrap up. Stephen, as always, man, thank you so much for spending the time with me. The Art of Impossible, I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I there are precious few books that so line up perfectly with what I have experienced. I forget who said it, but something along the lines of the if the research doesn't validate what is actually happening, then there's a flaw in the research. So to see it line up with things that I couldn't have put the eloquent words to it that you have, or and I certainly didn't have the science behind it, uh, but it's so lined up with what life seems like to me. Um, it was very, very eye-opening. So thank you, as always, for putting out another amazing piece of work into the world. And thank where can people you. learn more? Get the book, <clears throat> follow you, whatever the case may be. Yeah, all that. Uh, so the book... Um, Theartofimpossible.com uh, is, is, is a place. StephenCotler.com um, is another. And we talked about the passion recipe. So passion recipe, one word, dot com. That's for everybody listening um, as well. But theartofimpossible.com um, is uh, it was where you find it. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, support your indies. And Tom, uh, once, first of all, it's an honor that I've gotten to be on your show three times thank you for the interest in, in in the work that i do and and thank you for the work that you do in the world i appreciate it man my pleasure guys speaking of things that you will appreciate if you haven't already be sure to subscribe and until next time my friends be legendary take care mm -hmm.